fellowship at Sentinel United Methodist Church here in Metuchen, a friendly church on the hill where congregations have been worshiping uh, since 1866. We are back inside this morning after a wonderful outdoor concert on the lawn last Sunday. And that's probably a good thing, given the air quality issues we've been dealing with uh, in recent days. Pastor Sue is on vacation this week. After a hectic end of May schedule in which she and YK led the praise and worship services, not at just one conference, but at three conferences. Greater New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, and New York State. It was a great honor, I'm sure, for both of them, but very tiring, I'm sure, as well. In Pastor Sue's absence this morning, we are pleased to have as our guest speaker, the Reverend Gary Freeze. And uh, at this time, I would like to give you a, a short introduction about our guest. Reverend Fries began his ministry in 1996, serving as the local pastor at Wesley United Methodist Church in Bayonne. Served there for eight years, followed by two years at Calvary United Methodist Church in Kearney. During this time, he discerned his call and entered the deacon track by creating an addiction ministry with an appointment to the Intercounty Council on Drug and Alcohol Abuse Methadone Clinic in Kearney, where he served from 2008 to the present. He was ordained as a deacon in 2012 and had a secondary appointment as associate pastor at Grace United Methodist Church in Kearney from 2012 to 2013. 13, and again from 2015 to 2023. In between these two stints, Reverend Fries served at Wesley United Methodist Church in Belleville from 2013 to 2015. Reverend Fries was recently honored at the Greater New Jersey Annual Conference on the occasion of his retirement after 27 years of service and we congratulate him on that. And we thank him for coming out of retirement this morning, just three weeks into it, to speak to us about a deacon's ministry. Welcome, Reverend Gary. And now let's begin our worship service. So please stand if you are able, and join with me in the call to worship. Raise your voices in response to God's goodness. We praise you, O Lord, for all the blessings you have given us. Lift your hearts in sweet surrender to God's mercy. We thank you, O Lord, for hearing the prayers of our hearts. God is good. Praise be to God. The love and mercy of God never fail. Our opening hymn is, We have a story to tell to the nations, United Methodist Hymnal 569. <laughs> We have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light, a story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We have a song to be sung to the nations that shall lift their hearts to the Lord. A song that shall conquer evil and shatter the spear and sword. 
and shatter the spear and sword. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We have a message to give to the nations that the Lord who reigneth above shall send his Son to save us and show us that God is love. And show us that God is love. For the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth and kingdom of love and light. We have a Savior to show to the nations whom the path of sorrow hath trod that all the world's great peoples will come to the truth of God might come to the truth of God for the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth the kingdom of love and light please remain standing and join with me in the opening prayer Lord, this day we will hear of the miracles that have inspired people to be your disciples. We will hear of the disciples who are given the mandate to heal, to raise the dead, to proclaim the kingdom and the good news of God's redeeming love. We stand in that long line of those who are called. We are ready to work for you that this broken world may be healed. Amen. And please remain standing for our song of praise. Lord, you have come to the lake shore. Lord, you have come to the Sorry for the mix-up in that page number. Uh, at least you had it on the screen. Uh, hard for me to see. James Russell Lowell, the 19th century American poet, said, Children are God's apostles. Day by day, 
sent forth to preach of love and hope and peace. We invite our young apostles to come forward now for children's time with Shirley Concha. Hi. Good morning. How are you doing today? Okay. Two is fine. Right? And today uh, we are going to go to the story that we have sent me and it's about trick questions. Have you heard about trick questions? They are tricky, right? <laughs> yeah, the word itself says trick questions. So here are two trick questions I would like to ask you. Mm, what has many rings but no fingers? Anybody in the congregation? No. What? Yeah. It is. Yeah. A telephone. The answer it says it's a telephone. And the next trick question is how many animals did Moses take into the ark when God told him to build the ark, the flood is going to come? How many animals did Moses take? into the ark. You got that right, Sarah. Moses, it wasn't Moses, it was Noah that took the animals to the ark. So these are the trick questions for fun. But during Jesus' time, the Pharisees wanted to ask trick questions to Jesus because they wanted to trick him and trap him. It was for not fun, but it was for a bad intention. They had a bad intention. So they came to Jesus when he was preaching to ask a trick question. And the story goes like this. In today's Bible story, some religious guys tried to trap Jesus with a trick question. They asked him, should we obey the government or should we obey God? That was tricky, right? Jesus was becoming really popular and the religious leaders did not like that. They did not want him to have any of their power. So they tried to make Jesus look bad. The Pharisees weren't asking questions to get a true answer. They weren't interested in the answer. They just wanted to trick Jesus. Jesus knew what they were up to and gave them a perfect answer. His answer was, honor and obey God with what belongs to you. So it answered both of their questions. Now after hearing this story, you might wonder if Jesus doesn't like us to ask questions. But the truth is, Jesus loves it when we ask him questions. When we were young and still now, do you ask questions at school for your teachers? You raise your hand and ask questions, right? You ask for your parents. I know my kids ask million questions every day, and they are still today. So that's how Jesus loves it when we ask him questions. He encourages us to ask him questions so that we can learn and grow in our knowledge and faith. To learn more about this, let's watch a video together. In today's Bible lesson, we see how the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus with a tricky question. That wasn't good. So you may wonder, is it wrong to question Jesus? Let's find out. Jesus was the champion of answering questions. And the Pharisees weren't the only people who asked Jesus questions. The disciples asked Jesus questions so they could learn more. One day, Jesus talked about how it was hard for a rich person to enter heaven. Well, the disciples had a question. The disciples asked, Who then can be saved? And Jesus answered, With man, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. The disciples asked, Jesus answered. Another day, 
When Jesus talked about forgiveness, Peter had a big question. Hmm. Peter asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus for sure had a perfect answer. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Peter asked, Jesus answered, and we all learned how important it is to forgive others. On another day, two sisters spent time with Jesus, and one of them had questions. Martha asked Jesus, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Jesus had an answer and a lesson for Martha to learn. Jesus answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. That may have been hard for Martha to hear, but Jesus knows best and answers our questions perfectly each time. See, if you are willing to listen, learn, and grow, you can ask Jesus questions anytime. What questions would you ask Jesus? That was a nice video. Today we learned about the story of Pharisees who didn't have pure hearts. They just came to trick Jesus when they went to meet Jesus. They were singing when they were trying to trick him. However, Jesus welcomes all of us and loves us to hear our questions so that we can learn and grow in the knowledge of faith just like he did with his disciples. So if you have any questions, you can ask in your prayer, you can ask your parents, right? You'll get the answers. And don't hesitate to ask questions. If you ask questions, and your knowledge will grow. Whatever you want to know, you'll get to know, right? Even I, I am not stopping to ask questions because I am an adult. I still don't know many things. I don't know everything. I still ask questions, a lot of questions like you guys, right? So let us pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for your kindness and wisdom. Sometimes we might have questions about God and faith. When we ask you these questions, our Sunday school teachers or our pastor, we ask for your wisdom so that we may grow in knowledge and faith. In you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we have a birthday. It's Sarah's birthday today. So let's sing happy birthday to her. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. And lead us in the passing of the peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Thank you, Shirley. The scripture reading for this morning's message is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35. 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's the word of God for the people of God. Be now our centering music is Sanctuary from the Faith We Sing book, hymn number 2164.
Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. nice to be here at Centenary in Metuchen. I feel a little bit like I have connections here, and that's, that's a big word in the United Methodist Church is connection or connectionalism. Um, you had uh, Reverend Lorraine cover, I think, once or twice, and Reverend Lorraine and I were ordained together. She was in our, our, our class together. You keep a tightness with that. Also, there's a member of this church and his family that are very, very close friends of ours over the past couple years, uh, very close. So uh, he couldn't be here today, but um, so I'm glad, Bob, you'd be here. Uh, so I have that connection. And of course, Sua. I was on a district committee up in Meadowland, uh, actually we were Gateway North at that time, when she first started. And I'm gonna tell you a little story and tell her I told you her, okay. But, when she came the very, very first time before the committee for like an opening meeting, when she left, we all looked at each other and said, she's gonna be a bishop one day. So know that, and I know a lot has happened in her life since that day, because I, I did work with her on her candidacy at the beginning. Uh, but I think now she is heading on towards ordination. I'm not 100% sure if she's coming up for this next uh, group, but, um, so I'm, clo I'm close to her, and uh, so I feel closest to this church a little bit. And so today, I'm going to talk to you about, from this passage, what I am. Because I, I, as you heard in my introduction, I didn't start out as a deacon. I started as a local pastor. I thought I was going to be an elder. But God had a different road for me. And one of the ways I tell people is, you may be looking at my robe. You might be wondering, I've seen other pastors where they wear it around their neck. I don't think Sue can wear it yet. She's not sure yet. She can't wear a robe. But the stole, excuse me, the stole is different. This is a deacon's stole. When I got ordained, this is what was placed on me during that ceremony. Now many of you may not even know we have such an order such a thing as a deacon. Right? Now, some of you might remember a TV show back, maybe the 80s or 90s, I forget, called Amen. And in that, there was a character played by the famous actor Sherman Helmsley, obviously more known for playing George Jefferson. Again, I'm showing my age. Uh, if you haven't seen that, go watch it on Nickelodeon or one of those TV shows. But he played a character named Deacon Fry. Okay? Now, a Baptist deacon and a Methodist deacon are not the same, role-wise and theologically. So sometimes when I say I'm a deacon, sometimes people don't even know we're ordained. They're not used to that. See, in the United Methodist Church, we have an elder and we have a deacon. And elders are ordained to word, which means they can preach, they can preach, they do Bible study, to the sacraments, meaning like, for example, if you were supposed to have communion today, I could not do it. Deacons are not ordained to sacraments. They are ordained to order the running of the church. And they are ordained to service. Now, deacons are ordained to word. 
preach, teach Bible study. And we're ordained to service of compassion and justice. <coughs> Elders are ordained just to service, but general service. And we're very specific. Now, like I said, I cannot do communion here, but I do have the rights at the church in Kearney and to baptize. But it's usually the running of the church order that determines whether somebody wants to be a, an elder. In fact, I joke with new candidates because I work with them a lot in my role as a registrar for the DCOM. And I tell them, if you're okay with filling out conference reports and statistical reports and going to uh, SPR meetings, trustees meetings, church council meetings, Become an elder. If not, the deacon's orders are for you. Now for me, as I said, I started out as an elder, but I had a, a moment where I was meeting with my mentor. And I was getting ready to go up to the Board of Ordained Ministry to be an elder, and we were talking. And he asked me about my, how things were going, and I told him, well, I'm still working at the clinic uh, and all that. And he said, you know, that's deacon's ministry you're doing. And I said, really? And I thought deacons were just musicians and teachers. Oh, no, 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 no. no. They're all different things. He said, I don't, I'm not saying I don't think you can be an elder, but he said, I want you to look into the deacon's work. Well, on my way home, he was out in um, Hackettstown, Driving home, I felt my heart strangely warm. For those of you who are supposed to be Methodists, you should know what that means, but if not, look it up. Meaning, I knew this is where God was calling me. And so I changed my track, and I went on to become a deacon. Now, the reason I chose this passage, which actually is for next week, if you're a lectionary person, is because I believe it is the scriptural basis of the deacon's order, including the importance of compassion. And usually we use the foot washing passage from John because it's a general show of service. But I feel this story from Matthew speaks to the whole of the order of deacons. So let's look at it. In verse 35, we hear that Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching and healing. Well, we deacons are also out in the world. It's called ministry beyond the local church. Because technically, we are to be the bridge between the world and the church. Some are teachers in seminaries and schools. Many deacons are in some form of the healing or medical field, such as nurses, chaplains, and in my case, a pharmacist working in a methadone clinic, helping those with the disease of addiction. But yes, my first career was, and I technically still am, a registered pharmacist in the state of New Jersey. I attended Rutgers College of Pharmacy, not too far away from here. Graduated many more years than I want to say. Some are therapists, and I'm presently mentoring a deacon candidate who works as a mental health therapist. Now skip a second to verse 37. The workers are few. We've heard this passage many times. See, there are not many deacons. We can meet once a year at like a restaurant. This year at our annual conference, we actually met in the big dining hall at one table. I kind of spread this out. But there weren't many of us. Now if you want to get the elders all together, you couldn't even use this church. Because there's few of us. Why is this? Well, as I always joke, many reasons more people want to become elders is because you have that guaranteed appointment. We have to find our own jobs. We have to find our own appointments. And in some cultures, there's still a feeling that we are not real pastors because we're not leading a church. So, 
more and more deacons are being asked to local pastor churches if we have fewer pastors. And in verse 38, where he talks about sending out laborers into the harvest, most of us are out in the world. Most of us have our primary appointment outside of the church. I said one is a director of a woman's shelter. I said there are many chaplains in hospitals, nurses in hospitals. Uh, one is a director of mission for the jurisdiction. And as I mentioned before, myself, working as a pharmacist at a methadone clinic. I compounded the methadone, but I also dispensed it to them. And it was at the window, I was there for them. When they found out I was a pastor, you should, you should have heard some of the questions I was getting. You know, questions of, theologically, they're like, wow. And it gave me the opportunity to say, well, I'm at the church down the block. In fact, our, the clinic was about a five minute walk from the church. You're welcome to come any Sunday or whatever. And like I said, I know a good friend who is one of those people. See, we deacons are the embodiment of verse 38. We are the laborers out of the harvest. And then that brings us back to verse 36. I know we're kind of going weird here. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless. There's other words I've, I've read. Now, here's the thing about compassion. When one thinks of things that Christians talk about or argue about, which are in the Bible, we think of grace. We think of faith. The two big issues, homosexuality, abortion. Well, grace is mentioned 176 times in the Bible. Faith, 112. Homosexuality, basically two, maybe three. Abortion, believe it or not, is mentioned once in the book of Numbers. And I know this is going to sound like something out of a Monty Python movie. What it was, was if a man felt his wife was carrying an illegitimate child, they took him to the rabbi to read. They made up this concoction. And they would have the woman drink it. And the theory was, if the baby kind of aborted, they had a miscarriage, aha, it wasn't the husband's baby. But if it lived somehow, it was. Like I said, uh, that's the only thing we have even close to it. But compassion, or even one of its synonyms, is found 300 times. That's to make one think, what is the priority of God? And verse 36 is the compassion verse. And some versions say he had compassion for them as they were confused, harassed, and worried different translations. See, deacon ministry is one of compassion for those who are in need, confused, harassed, and helpless. Jesus had compassion for the hurting and oppressed. And if we are to be, I'm sorry, if we are to be followers of Jesus, and not just in name only, we also must have the same compassion for those suffering and in despair of our time. We are not to do service that encourages greed, prejudice, hate, anger. Compassion means to feel pity, sorrow for the suffering of troubles of others, accompanied by an urge to help. And that is what is key. It makes it more than just sympathy. And it comes from two Latin words that mean suffer with. A compassionate response to suffering requires that one be moved by that suffering and act to remove the immediate effects of the suffering and even to correct the structures which may have given rise to the suffering in the beginning. Antonyms to compassion include indifference, cold-heartedness, 
which I'm sorry to say to a lot of young people today, especially those who classify as the nuns, none of the above, think what Christians are more about. At best, they feel we are indifferent to those hurting. At worst, we are cold-hearted. The truth is, I know many who are not that way. I hear it all the time when we deacons meet and we just talk about our, the ministries we're doing and who we're helping. It's like my work at the clinic, working with people with the disease, and yes, it's a disease of addiction. And I've seen it over the years, and I see how our views of it has changed, especially as it's hitting different demographics now. But I always tell any new coworker that came in, whether it be a nurse or a new counselor, I always say, if you don't have, if you don't acquire a compassion for these patients, find another job. Because to me, compassion is a verb. It's not just a feeling. In fact, the Dalai Lama said one time, it is not enough to be compassionate. You must act. You know, it, it's funny that I got into the deacon ministry because when I was in college, and I never thought about this at the beginning when I was switching over, at Rutgers I was a member of a fraternity called APO, Alpha Phi Omega. It was a service fraternity. Go away, that's it. Everybody was a brother. My big brother, the one that mentored me in the guard, was actually a female. And what we did there was we did different projects. We worked at a senior citizen's building, kind of a whatever job had to be done for them. Clean the windows, do food shopping. We, would, we helped run the March of Dimes walkathon, and they had walkathon for Somerset County or Middlesex County, and a few others. So I should have known. I was called to be a deacon, to do service. Now, we're also the bridge to the church, meaning we relate the world to the church, but we also have to relate the people in the church to their ministries of compassion and justice and to help them fulfill them. We are in the church to make the people of the church be aware of the harassed and helpless out beyond the walls of the church. that's important to be a church. You'd be surprised how reaching out really helps. Michael Slaughter, one of the United Methodist pastors in Ohio, writes a lot of books, said one time, if it isn't good news for the poor, it isn't the good news of Jesus Christ. I would tweak that to say, if the ministry isn't about compassion, compassion for the harassed and helpless, it is at ministry. There's an anonymous quote that maybe sums it up best in why I'm a deacon. It is, compassion is at the heart of every little thing we do. It is the dearest quality we possess, yet all too often it can be cast aside with consequences too tragic to speak of. To lose our compassion, we lose what it is to be human. So if someone comes to me as a candidate for ministry and asks if they should be a deacon, I tell them to be a deacon, you need a passion for compassion. And truthfully, shouldn't all Christians? Amen. I always say at the end of these sermons, I. It's not the first place I've done a sermon about the deacon's orders. I'm always available for questions if you have regarding this. But now we'll have a time of prayer. And I know in the back of your bulletin you have a prayer list. And we'll keep some of those names in prayer as I lead the prayer this morning. I usually do a thing where in the middle of the prayer, if you have a prayer request, just to yell it out loud. 
God can hear, even if you speak at the same time. God's hearing is so much better than ours. Do not worry about that. But let us pray. Gracious and loving Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us, the start of a new week. We thank you that the smoky haze is leaving us now, but we still pray for those affected by the fires in Canada, those affected by the haze and the smoke due to illnesses, Lord, we thank you that we were able to come here this morning to sing to you, to pray to you. Lord, we pray for those who could not be with us today, whether for traveling or other issues, those who are watching live. We pray for those who will be watching later. Lord, we pray that a spirit of compassion can be upon all of us. We can turn to those in need, even if it's just to be an ear. We ask for your spirit to guide us and to strengthen us for that. Lord, we pray to be able to go out and show Jesus to everyone we meet. Lord, we pray continued prayers for the people of the Ukraine. We pray for Linda Serentino, for John Lashley, for Ariana and her father Peter, and again for Ukraine, for those affected by the dam breaking. Lord, now hear the prayers of your people. heard prayers this morning quietly. People were just thinking names. We know you know our wants and needs before we even think them. And we know you will answer each and every prayer. So Lord, we bring this prayer to you in the name of your Son, the Savior of all creation, Jesus Christ who when asked about prayer, told his disciples, tells us today, pray like this, together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Gary, for your inspiring message and for educating us about what a deacon is and does. I've been a Methodist for 50 plus years and uh, I've learned a lot this morning. Thank you. The Bible teaches us to be generous in very, every aspect of our lives. The world discovers the power of Christ when they see the image of him reflected in our lives. And generosity is very much a part of Christ's nature. We have received from God without payment. Let us give generously 
out of God's bounty, living as signs of the kingdom of heaven. June's barrel offering is designated for Centenary's Vacation Bible School, which is fast approaching, uh, it'll be here in two weeks. And uh, this is a great outreach to the local community. And we've always been proud of the fact that we've offered it to the community without charge. And it's your support through the barrel offerings each year that make that possible. So I invite you to come forward now with your offerings. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So it left me with several messages and announcements to share with you this morning. So let me run through those quickly. First of all, again, welcome to Centenary, uh, those who are here, those who are watching from home. And we're glad that you're worshiping us with us this morning. If this is your first time joining us, please take some time to fill out our online connect card and Pastor Sue will reach out to you sometime during the coming week. Our church has partnered for a number of years with Replenish, the Middlesex County Food Network that supports some 80 food pantries, food banks throughout the greater Middlesex County area. We collect food every week and it's picked up every month by Replenish and goes to a lot of these different organizations to support those who are in need of food assistance. We invite the community to participate in this ministry, and we put a green bin outside our front door uh, two times a week on Wednesday morning and Sunday morning from 9.30 until noon, and we invite you to drop your donations off at that time. We thank you for your continued generosity and support of this much needed food collection ministry. As I noted uh, just a couple of minutes ago, uh, VBS is fast approaching. Uh, the dates are June 27th to 29th. That's a Tuesday through Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. Dinner will be served free of charge to children in the community. And uh, we still have openings for volunteers if you would like to help out with this ministry, 
please contact Grace. She's not here this morning, but uh, please get in touch with her if you'd like to help out with BBS. We held our monthly sandwich making night on Thursday. We were missing a couple of our regulars, but we had some other people fill in admirably. And uh, we made about 255 sandwiches. The next morning uh, in our collective ministry at uh, New Dover United Methodist Church, uh, the volunteers from three local churches packed uh, 352 sandwich bags which were promptly delivered to St. Joseph's Social Service Center in Elizabeth. Uh, the volunteers we had here Thursday night making sandwiches, in addition to myself, were uh, Donna, Sonia, Say, and Nino. So thank you very much for your support of this ministry. I'm still basking in the afterglow of last week's wonderful outdoor spring healing concert. Uh, I thought that was uh, quite an impressive event. And uh, I'd like to again thank everybody who made it possible, starting with our choir director of music, minister director Brian, and uh, our choir, and uh, all of our singers and uh, instrumentalists. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for a great service. Uh, it's so good to be outdoors when the air is clean. <laughs> All right, and next Sunday, uh, Pastor Sue will be back in the pulpit and we will be celebrating Father's Day and honoring uh, graduates in the class of 2023, which is an annual tradition. So we hope to see you then. Does anybody else have any announcements that they would like to share with the congregation? If not, we will sing our closing hymn, Here I Am, Lord, number, I hope, 593. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright, all who bear my light to them, whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will. I will 
finest bread I will provide till their hearts be satisfied I will give my life for them my hand will save here I am Lord is it I Lord I have heard you call 